This is part one of chapter nine, and we're going to be looking at additional inventory issues, which have a lot to do with how do you value the inventory. Okay, loss of inventory value. Well, what ends up happening is a lot of times we buy things and the cost goes down. So, what we like to do is make sure that when we look at our inventory, we value it at what we consider net realizable value, which is the estimated selling price in an item, item in inventory less reasonably predictable costs of completion, disposal, and transportation. We use net realizable value when the sale price goes below the original cost. This lower cost or net realizable value. This approach begins with replacement cost, then applies two additional limitations to valuing ending inventory. Ceiling is the net realizable value, which is the sales price minus disposal costs. And what we call the floor is the net realizable value, which is the ceiling, less a normal profit margin. Now what the rule is, is that the price has to fall within this range. It cannot be higher, it cannot be lower. So, if the net realizable value is higher than the ceiling, we use the ceiling. If it's lower than the floor, we lose the, use the floor. And if it's in the middle, that's the number we use. So we'll go through some examples of this. So this is like a representation. I think it gives you a nice view of what it looks like. So what we're trying to do is we're going one step further when we try to figure out what is market. So we have to go through that process first before we can then compare it to what we paid for it. Because what we're going to do is we're going to look at market versus cost and whichever is lower is what we're going to value it at. But how do you come up with market? Well, what we have to do is we have to look at the replacement cost and we have to say, does it fall within this range, i.e. the ceiling, which is the selling price minus disposal costs, or is it lower than the floor, which is the net realizable value less normal profit margin. So now we're going to walk through some examples on how to do this. This is really not too bad. All right, here we go. We have these co columns. We have the quantity, the unit cost, the replacement cost, the estimated selling price, the completion and disposal cost, and the normal profit margin per unit in dollars. So here's how we start, is we take the estimated selling price, and we subtract the co completion and disposal unit cost, which tells us our ceiling in this example is going to be $9. Now we're going to do the floor, which is going to be that $9 we just calculated minus the profit margin. So now what we have is our ceiling, which means that the replacement cost can't be higher than 9 or less than $7.20. So, the designated market would be the 840 because it falls within the range of the ceiling of 9 and the floor of 740. Again, if it had been higher than 9, we would have used $9. If the replacement cost had been lower than 720, we'd use the 720. So now let's walk through an actual example. And I go through, this is how I solve the problems, which are similar to your homework. All right, first, I determine the ceiling and the floor. So here are our selling prices for A, B, C, D, and E. I have disposal costs. I'm going to subtract those. And now I have my ceiling, or net realizable value, for these items. Now what I'm going to do is subtract out the profit. And now I have my floor. Now, the next thing I do is determine designated market. So, what I need to do is I need to look at
our replacement cost. And based on this, what I've got to do, an example would be for my first one. Does the $8.40 fall within $9.720? It does, so that would be my designated mark. Now for the next one, my replacement cost is $7.90, my ceiling is $8.50, my floor is $7.30, so that would also be my designated market. Now we have $5.40 as the replacement. It goes below the ceiling of $5.45, which means we have to use the $5.45 as the designated market. Now remember, when we come up with the designated market, then we're going to compare this to cost to decide how to value our inventory and decide whether we have to write it down. Next, we have our $4.20. That falls within our range, so we would use that number. And our last is the replacement cost is $6.30, which is above our ceiling, which means we have to use the $6. Now that we've come up with our designated market, we're going to go to step three. All right, step three. What we are now going to do is compare our designated market and what we originally paid for it. And whichever is lower is going to be the number we use. So in A, the cost is lower, so we leave that the same. We don't have to do anything. For B, the designated market is lower, which means that I have to write some of that down. For C, our designated marker is lower, so we're going to have to write that down. For D, the cost is less, so we're not going to have to do anything for that one. And for the last one, the designated market is lower, so we're going to have to use the $6, which means it looks like we're going to have to write down some of our inventory. Now what we're going to do is subtract that from our cost, and that is going to tell us the difference per unit, and then we're going to take it times the number of units, and what that tells us is we're going to have to write down 950000 and take that depending on what's going on, whether this is normal or whether this is abnormal, we'll tell you how you're going to account for this. So now we're going to look at, well, how do you record this loss? Because we have a $950 loss or $950,000, depending. So there are two ways you can account for inventory loss. The first is the cost of goods sold method. This is going to be used if it is common for you to have write downs and in that case you're going to debit cost of goods sold for the loss and you do not show as a separate line item on the income statement so if this is a common thing and it's not a major dollar amount this is what you would do now the loss method this would be done if the amount is large or unusual you would debit account called loss on decline in inventory and show as part of other on the income statement. So it would be separated out. Regardless of the method, the contra inventory account balance after the adjustment should equal the current year adjustment. So what that tells us, at the end of the year, our contra inventory account has to equal 950 from our example. Now, if the write-down is not unusual, it goes to cost of goods sold. And remember, what we're doing is looking at the balance in the account, which is currently 250, and we know that it should be 750. So what we have to do is adjust for the $700. Now, if it's unusual, this would be our journal entry. Okay. Either way, at the end of the year our allowance to reduce inventory to market, its ending balance should be 950. Now we're going to look at the last part of this presentation, which is the gross profit method. This is a pretty easy one to use. It can only be used to estimate in internal reporting. It cannot be used on the financial statements. So, Again, there's two methods for estimating ending inventory. One's called the gross profit method. It can be used for financial report. It cannot be used for financial reporting because it's too general. And if you read in the textbook, it doesn't incorporate all the various issues associated with inventory because it assumes a flat gross profit rate. 
Gap requires a physical inventory. It assumes there is one gross margin for all goods. The retail method. Now, this is used by retailers. And usually they don't have to do a physical account. And we're going to go over that in part two and three of this presentation. Now, the gross profit percentage. To do the gross profit method, you need to have the gross profit on sales. If you get gross profit on the cost, you need to convert. Okay, so if you ever get the issue where it's, if it says it's gross profit on um, cost, markup based on cost, you got to convert it. And that's how you convert it. That's the formula. So if you're given 25% gross profit on cost, you would convert it to 20% for gross profit on sales. Now let me walk you through the formula. And you just put it in this format and you'll get it right every time. You start with beginning purchases plus net purchases minus purchase returns and allowances minus purchase discounts plus freight gives you total cost of goods available for sale. Then what you're going to do is estimate cost of goods sold by taking net sales minus sales times gross profit. And that's going to give your estimated ending inventory. Now we'll walk through an example. So, what fire destroyed the inventory of a company. They had 1.9 million in net purchases. Oh, they had a beginning inventory, I'm sorry, of 1.9. They had net purchases of 5.8. Freight in was 400,000, and they had sales of 8.2. The gross profit was estimated at 20%. So here's how you do this. Start with your beginning inventory. Add your purchases plus your freight. That gives you your total cost of goods available for sale. Now you're going to estimate cost of goods sold. You're going to take your net sales, and then what you're going to do is subtract out the gross profit, estimated gross profit, and that's going to give you estimated cost of goods sold, which gives you estimated ending inventory. And that concludes part one of this three-part presentation on additional issues for inventory.